It's one o'clock, so I think we'll get started. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. It's the sixth Caden Community Champions webinar. My name is Jenny Herbin, and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator here at the Canadian Deprescribing Network. So for those of you who don't know us yet, um, we do use the acronym CADEN for the Canadian Deprescribing Network because it can be a little bit of a mouthful. Um, and you'll be hearing CADEN, us use the term CADEN throughout the webinar today. Um, so this webinar series is about bringing people together across Canada who are championing medication safety for older adults in their communities. And one of the main goals of this series is to empower organizations that serve, work with, and advocate for older adults with information, tools, and resources about safely managing medications. If this isn't the first time you're hearing this Zoom technical lesson, please hang in there. I know that we do have some new participants with us today, so I'd like to give a brief overview to make sure everyone is comfortable with the technology. For those of you who've joined by phone, you're able to follow the auditory presentation, although not the visual, so this technical overview will be a little less relevant for you. For those who've joined the webinar by computer, you're able to follow the presentation visually, so to see and hear the speakers and follow the PowerPoint slides. So if you're on your computer, at the bottom center of your screen, you'll see a button that says chat. If you move your mouse over that button and then click, a chat box will pop up. The chat box is one of the ways that you can communicate with the panelists and myself today. If you experience any technical issues during the webinar, please don't hesitate to write us a message in the chat box and we'll do our best to help. You can also select who you would like to send your message to in the chat box by clicking on the drop down menu next to the to field. And when you choose to all panelists, only the presenters and myself can see your questions. And that will give you some anonymity if you like. Um, just next to the chat button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll also see a Q&A button. So during the interactive portion of the webinar, uh, about halfway through the second portion really, um, the Q&A pop-up window is where you can ask your questions to Joanna and Alan. And in this Q&A uh, portion, you also have the option of sending questions anonymously. Um, we would love for this session to be interactive, so please feel welcome to post your comments and questions in uh, the Q&A or the chat. Uh, just so you know, all of your phone lines and computers have been muted for the time being. This just helps us eliminate any background noise. So don't worry, we can't hear you. Finally, this webinar will be recorded and put online sometime in the next few days. Um, we'll be sending out a link and we'd encourage you to share it with those in your communities and networks who weren't able to join us. So that covers it for the technical overview. Looks like we have about uh, 20 or so people joining us from across the country. Um, I'd now like to welcome our guest speakers. Today we have Joanna Trimble with us. Joanna is a, patient, uh, is a passionate patient advocate and champion for the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. She is also a lecturer on care of the elderly at the UBC Faculty of Medicine and a public member of the Geriatrics and Palliative Care Committee of Doctors of BC. Among her many other hats, Caden is lucky to have her as a member of their Public Awareness Committee. Hi, Joanna. Hello. Nice to be here. Um, and now we'll welcome our second guest, Alan Castles. You may know Alan as a journalist and researcher on pharmaceutical policy and healthcare. He's the author of several books, including Selling Sickness, How the World's Biggest Pharmaceutical Companies Are Turning Us All Into Patients, and most recently, The Cochrane Collaboration, Medicine's Best Kept Secret. Great to be here. Alan, thanks. Um, so the flow for today will go like this. Um, Joanna will start us off. She'll be sharing her mother-in-law's story about polypharmacy and a dangerous medication reaction. And then she'll talk to us about her family's experience through that and what they learned. Following Joanna's presentation, Alan uh, Castles will take the floor and he'll lead us through um, 
uh, further discussion and an, um, an interactive portion. Um, and we'll be looking at what to do if we suspect someone is taking too many pills. Finally, to wrap up, I'll present a couple of Cadence tools that can be helpful resources for learning about and practicing safe medication use. So I will give the floor over to Joanna Trimble. Thanks very much, Jenny. And uh, I will be speaking for maybe 20 minutes to 30 minutes, and then we'll be having a discussion. Ellen will have a lot of good questions to ask, I know, because he's an excellent interviewer. So this is the story of my mother-in-law. Uh, it happened several years ago, and I'm going to tell you what happened and then tell you about some of the conclusions we drew and some of the learning that we had um, because of going through this with our family. Um, have I got control of the whoops, screen? Yes. Here. Ah, there we are. So this is my mother-in-law when she was a child in Alberta. Um, very, very poor family raised on a sheep farm uh, in Alberta and um, very determined little girl. In fact, uh, she was able to put herself through university by working um, and became a teacher and was much beloved by the students as being a real sort of force in their lives. And she was the same for us in our family. She was, a, she was really the matriarch and always could be there for good advice and affection. So this is kind of the beginning of our story. Um, Fervid was about 86 when this story started. And this is her apartment that she had chosen for herself in a senior's residence. She was very proud of being able to manage things on her own. And as many, many uh, elderly people say, not be a burden to her family. So here she is rather proudly sitting next to the, I think it's the cot that we were sleeping on when we would come and, and visit her. Um, the story starts with Fervid getting the flu one winter and um, feeling very, very sick and very weak when she woke up one morning. She felt so weak and dizzy that she felt if she stood up, she was probably going to fall over. So she phoned my sister-in-law, Kathy, who lived closest to her and was taken to um, the hospital emergency room near them, where it was found that, in fact, she was dehydrated, which might have happened from, you know, the flu. She was also on a water pill um, and it, she was rehydrated and sent home without being admitted. And when she got back to her own apartment, um, the doctor for the facility decided that Fervid was really a little too weak to be able to manage things herself because she was making her own breakfast and lunch and she would go down to the big dining room for dinner. Um, and it was felt that she should go over to the healthcare center, which was an attached uh, building with skilled nursing um, care where she would just have a few days of recuperation and then she'd be back to her apartment. But what we began to notice as a family is that she was starting to have this, a real mental or cognitive decline after she entered the care center. And we were starting to worry. This is my husband's brother, Bruce, starting to worry, as you can see. And this is Fervid looking rather out of it. And this just continued uh, to get worse. She became increasingly confused. She was, at times, she was delirious. Um, she was delusional. She was seeing people who weren't there. Um, she was having physical symptoms, was actually having to stay in bed most of the time. And we were extremely confused as to why she was having all of these symptoms that didn't make sense to the family at all. You know, thinking of what, why she had been in there for a few days of recuperation. It just didn't make any sense to us um, from what we knew of Fervid and her condition. So we decided that we would have to um, try to get to the bottom of it ourselves as a family. Nobody working um, at the care center seemed to think this was a problem. 
um, they saw lots of old people were in, that were in this kind of condition. So this is myself, my husband, Fervid, and Kathy, uh, my, my uh, husband's sister, who was luckily uh, had a lot of legal responsibility for Fervid and was also a retired nurse. So this is what I call the family care team. And I have to say that if you're going to take steps to get things changed for your elder, if they're in residential care, or even if they're at home, try and get the family on board or some of the family on board with you because it's a lot harder for the system and doctors to resist two or three family members than just one who they can kind of dismiss as, you know, somebody who's just trying to cause trouble. And I think this is also some good advice that, that I found. Um, assume that any new symptom you develop upon starting a new drug may be caused by the drug. If you have a new symptom, psychiatric or otherwise, report it to your doctor. So that's what we ended up seeing. We saw all these new symptoms of confusion and delusional behavior, hallucination. And we also found out that in fact, she had been given two new drugs that we weren't aware of. So one of the problems with um, trying to uh, look for these adverse drug reactions is that they're often not looked for. They seem to not be considered as a first place to look for when somebody is having new problems that they didn't have before. I think there's a bit of resistance. Um, doctors don't want to think that a medication they're giving to help somebody actually ends up hurting them. But if you're on a lot of drugs, um, their interactions are much more likely. And also just the, the sheer volume of drugs can be a problem. You're taking many, many chemicals every day. Those drugs are never tested in that kind of way. You know, They're tested singly for a single condition, not when they're taken, you know, numbers of them for one person. So we were able to do some uh, research and I took over the research part because I have a library background. I know how to find information. And what we did figure out from her symptoms is that she was having um, a, a, an interact, not so much an interaction as a toxicity. She was taking two drugs. She'd been given two drugs, citalopram, which is an SSRI antidepressant, and she'd been given tramadol, which is a pain drug and also affects serotonin. Um, we saw these symptoms in fervid, confusion, agitation, lethargy, rapid heart rate, sweating, low fever, and particularly um, what's called myoclonus, which is twitching, twitching a muscle. We saw Fervid making this strange arm movement that made no sense to, to us. We'd never seen her do it before. Also, I think one of the very big problems, uh, not just not looking for side effects, but when you have drugs that are prescribed by more than one provider. In Fervid's case, it was a nurse practitioner on the floor at um, the care center plus a geriatric psychiatrist who was a consultant who came around to some of the residential care facilities and consulted. So one was prescribing, the psychiatrist was prescribing the antidepressant and the, the pain drug was uh, prescribed by the nurse practitioner on the floor. And it's very unclear as to who actually has responsibility for making sure when there is more than one drug being prescribed Who's responsible for making sure there's not an interaction? Or do they even know? Did the psychiatrist even know she was on this pain drug? Did he know there would be a, a reaction by having two serotonin, uh, serotonergic drugs? I think the advantage that the family has and why we have to be involved as a team with care of our, our elders is that we know the patient's baseline. We know what's normal for that person, how they usually are. And although I'm sure everyone um, in, the, in the care center intended, intended well, they didn't really know the big picture for that frail person in front of them. 
And uh, in fact, the geriatric psychiatrist didn't know her. He was a consultant. And uh, even the nurse practitioner on the floor, Fervid had been transferred into that care center fairly recently. So that nurse practitioner didn't know her either. So that's what we did find, or that's what certainly what we suspected, that it was serotonin toxicity or serotonin syndrome, it's sometimes called. And what she was experiencing with all the confusion, which had been, by the way, diagnosed as a urinary tract infection, which sometimes causes confusion, was actually delirium from a drug toxicity. And what was about to happen is that the geriatric psychiatrist was invited back in uh, to treat Fervid and said that her condition, her confusion, was probably vascular dementia. The family didn't believe it. We'd never seen the slightest uh, sign of Fervid having any dementia. So by this point, we had already figured that she was suffering from a drug interaction because of the research we'd done. And we were pretty sure it was not vascular dementia. And what she would have been given is another drug for that condition. So I guess the question um, that I have and that many of you might have is why did the family discover the problem rather than the medical staff? So I think one of the reasons is family spends hours at the bedside. Not every family, but many of us who are concerned, especially if our, our uh, elderly family member is, is, not, is, is getting worse, we spend a lot of time there and we take note of what's happening. So when Fervid was um, having this drug reaction, I was writing down all the symptoms that I could see and the things that she told me, because sometimes she would be completely confused and out of it, and other times she'd have some clarity and would be able to say, gee, I don't know what happened, I tried to get up, uh, I was all uncoordinated. That, in fact, is one of the, the symptoms of uh, serotonin um, toxicity or syndrome. We also, of course, know the person very well. We know what is normal for them and what is not, what we expect to see as their normal behavior. And of course, you have to remember that the, that the patient often cannot speak for themselves, especially if they're in a confused state. What's really important too is that the family has skin, what you call skin in the game. We're not gonna give up and accept an answer that makes no sense to us. Staff, on the other hand, although they intend well, they tend to see what they expect to see in that population, not in that individual. The family is looking at the individual. What is this strange thing that's happening and why is it happening? The staff is seeing, oh, this is an old confused lady in bed. This happens all the time. It's probably a urinary tract infection. So you've got two different, very different perspectives. And these perspectives often don't get discussed between the family and the care staff. Staff are also just seeing a snapshot of the present moment. We're looking for what's unusual. So this is a quote I very much like from Stephen Lewis, um, that quality of life goals may be more important to patients than submitting to every conceivable attempt to defy decline and death. In other words, every possible drug. And what is optimal care for a single condition often becomes a big risk factor if there are many other conditions and many other drugs being taken at the same time. So just going with prescribing guidelines that were developed for it, just blood pressure or just blood sugar, <laughs> it's often not a good way to go um, when you're dealing with someone who's taking a lot of medications. So the process, how did the process in, unfold for our family? Um, we asked for, when we discovered that we thought there was a drug interaction, we tried to get a medication review and we were told uh, by the staff that they were too busy and it wasn't an emergency. And then what happened is what's called sometimes the prescribing cascade. In other words, drugs are given 
to treat the side effects of the drugs the person's already on. And that did happen. Uh, Fervid was put on several more drugs to treat the heart rate problems, the um, delirium and so on that she was experiencing. Um, the next thing that happened is, is there was a, a diagnosis of vascular dementia. The family didn't believe it. Um, and eventually what we were able to do is get a medication review. In fact, what happened is once we saw that there was going to be yet another drug prescribed, um, we put our foot down basically and insisted that we needed to have a medication review. And several of these cascade drugs were stopped along with the SSRI antidepressants and the, and the tramadol, the pain drug. And um, not quite soon enough. You know, we castigate ourselves for not acting sooner or trying more things to get our voice heard. Because Fervid had by then been in mostly bedridden for two or three months. She had lost a lot of function and mobility while being in bed. She couldn't go back to her apartment, but she did return completely back to normal cognitively. So uh, just to put a plug in here for Alan Castles and the Therapeutics Initiative, um, Alan's now the communications officer for the Therapeutics Initiative. They do independent reviews of drugs. At the time this was all going on, I happened to read one of their letters that they sent out periodically, which happened to be on the drug that they were about to prescribe for um, Fervid once they decided she had vascular dementia, even though we didn't think she had. So the conclusions of that letter were that this particular drug had not been demonstrated to improve outcomes of importance to patients and caregivers, and that also it could increase the risk of serious adverse events, <clears throat> serious drug reactions. Fervid was already having those. So we didn't want to add another, yet another drug to the mix when we didn't even believe that she had vascular dementia. So I think one of the things we have to be very aware of um, around any, any um, medication use is that there are drugs that are called prevention drugs. Um, they're often described as things like, oh, take this drug and it'll prevent you from having a heart attack. I think what we have to understand is there's no, there's no real prevention drugs. Um, antibiotics might be close, insulin's very close, but most prevention drugs are basically drugs for risk management. They may make your risk of getting something in the future a little lower, but they're not going to prevent it. And many of the drugs don't really lower your risk a lot, and they may not work for you as an individual. I think we all believe or have believed that once a drug is approved and researched and it's on the market, if you take it for a condition, everyone gets the benefit. Well, that's not actually how it works. And I really liked this quote from um, a doctor in the UK, let us not have anyone dying from impeccable risk factor management. Because the more drugs you get, the more likely you are to end up in the hospital with a drug interaction. So, um, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about is some of, the, some of the things we learned as we went through this process with Fervid and also what I've learned doing this kind of uh, patient advisor, patient advocacy work in the last, I guess it's been about, it's been almost 10 years now that I've been doing it. Things that you should know about, that you should do if you're suspecting there's a problem. One of the first things you need to do is you need to get the medication list of the person, of your elder. Um, that may not be easy because there's different uh, laws in different provinces about how you can be the designated person to make health decisions for your elder if they're not able to, to do it themselves. In BC, it's called a representation agreement. 
people seem to think that a power of attorney will do that. It's, it's not actually true. Power of attorney just handles legal and financial decisions. You need to have a represented representation agreement to get things like drug lists, medication lists. So I really would advise you to look into that. I would probably now, if I was going through this uh, process again, I would know enough to go to a pharmacist and go through the medication list with a, a really serious review of what is on that list and what symptoms that my elder might be showing that I've noticed or that they've talked about. At the time, 10 years ago, I didn't even know what a pharmacist did, you know, really. Uh, I thought they put pills into bottles and gave them to people. You know, their, their job is so incredibly important and we don't use them enough. Doctors don't get the kind of training on drugs that pharmacists get. Um, I would be asking that pharmacist what each drug is for. And could there be, be problematical drugs that could be either paused and monitored or stopped or reduced or safer drugs substituted? And then I would insist on a medication review and take my family members on board with me to a doctor or care home and with the results of that pharmaceutical review and um, ask them to do a thorough medication review for my elder. Um, I'm afraid I only know the BC scenario. Um, in BC, you're entitled to a free pharmacist review of the drugs you're on if you're on five or more drugs. So I happened to be walking around, uh, around 41st and Canby and saw this sign outside of a pharmacy just around Christmas time and took a, pic a picture of it. So pharmacies do offer this service. Sometimes it will be predicated on whether they have the actual staff to do the review. If it's just pharmacy techs on duty, they may not be able to do it or you may have to come back for it. The other thing that we are um, lucky to have here in Vancouver, although I don't think that many people know about it, there is a pharmacist clinic at UBC at the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences. And that pharmacist, pharmacist clinic will do medication reviews. And you, you don't have to be referred, you can refer yourself. You can go online and refer yourself and get a meeting with a pharmacist. You have to understand there may be a pharmacy student sitting in on the meeting, but they can do a very good medication review. And a lot of their reviews are to do with people being on a lot of medications. Sometimes uh, they do a review because someone's been told they have to go on a medication for the rest of their life and they want a second opinion. <clears throat> Doctors use this a lot because they're not really trained to deprescribe, as we call it, or stop or reduce or monitor drugs. So the last thing, um, one of the last things I wanted to talk to you about is the human part of all this. Um, Bourbon lived for another four years after that drug interaction. That's very unusual in residential care. 18 months is the usual time that someone is in residential care. And believe me, at the end of the 18 months, they're not going home. That's not where they're going. They usually die within about 18 months. Furbid lived for four years. She was in, actually in pretty good health. She was still unable to get around um, with a walker. Um, we would take her out with a, a wheelchair but we were able to enjoy her company, take her out for oysters and white wine at her favorite restaurant down the hill. And she also had a lot to say to us um, as family members, um, as she knew that she was actually getting closer to her own death. Um, this is a picture of her um, on the left there is her 86th birthday party when she was very much over medicated. And on the right is her ninth birthday, when she'd been taken off almost all the drugs that she was on. You can see a big difference in her appearance. So Furbid talked to us all as, as family members individually, telling us what we had meant to her, um, giving us advice, which Furbid loved to do. 
she always gave very good advice and uh, it wasn't always um, all sweetness and light. If she thought you needed a little correction, she would give it to you, uh, which is why that last line uh, always made me, made me a bit uneasy. I'll be out there watching you. It's like, oh my gosh, it's not over yet. <laughs> <laughs> but she was um, wonderfully articulate and we had some amazing conversations with her that are very much unlike any kind of, you know, um, casual chat they really cut right to the core of what it was like um, to be alive and what she had learned and the wisdom that she'd learned and how much she loved her family so just to recap um, the problems that we saw with her care we wish there had been a discussion of the so-called depression that she was uh, given the antidepressant, the SSRI antidepressant for, because I think we might have been able to help with that. I don't think she was depressed. I think she was grieving because now she was in this care center, which felt like a hospital and couldn't go back home. I think that's enough to make anyone uh, grieve. Um, the pr problems are also with multiple prescribers that don't know the patient well. They did not coordinate care between them, as far as we could see. Medication review was not done in a timely manner. So Fervid was actually quite debilitated, lost mobility, lost function, before we could actually get this uh, dealt with. And lot, it led to the loss of her home and her independence. As a family, we found it had a great effect on us. Um, one of the things that we kick ourselves for is we didn't have the confidence to press our case for further about getting a medication review quickly to administration if we had to. Fervid lost her independent spirit and became fearful from being in a facility where she's bedridden and completely looked after by everybody else. Um, you may have heard the term learned helplessness. Uh, there's also a strange combination residential care of anxiety, boredom, and isolation, and lack of privacy all at the same time. Uh, residents don't have much say over their life. Our family, of course, lost confidence in the quality of, of care that Fervid was getting. So here's the um, subtitle coming up of this presentation. <laughs> if I knew then what I know now. Number one, most important, instead of agreeing to a few days of re recuperation in the care center, we wish we had arranged to have a family member just stay with Fervid for a few days until she was feeling better. Can you get that? The, the second, uh, the second point um, that we wish we had done was that when a medication review was refused by the doctor, we should have gone to management then and insisted on it. We feared being a difficult family. We feared being ignored or marginalized or seen as the enemy by staff. I think that's pretty common uh, from other people I've talked to who are trying to deal with these problems. And I guess as a last resort, we could have gone to the media and made a big stink about it. Um, and I have read some studies that actually show that patients with so-called difficult families actually end up getting better care. So uh, to conclude, um, I just want to show you what too many drugs looks like. So these are photographs, um, the first one of Fervid, and I have two others that were that were uh, given to me by daughters of uh, women that were in residential care who had too many drugs prescribed. They've given me permission to use uh, the first name of their mothers and also um, permission to use these pictures. So this is a before and after uh, picture of Fervid and the before is the medicated picture on the left. And the after is not too long after the drugs had all been stopped and washed out and she was taken off the extra drugs she'd been given for side effects. 
This is her um, down uh, the hill in her favorite restaurant with us, um, having white wine and oysters. And um, as you can see from her face, it's quite a different, it's quite a different matter once the drugs are no longer uh, interfering with her life. Uh, this is Daisy. Uh, her daughter Elizabeth um, gave me these pictures and has allowed me to use them. Um, Daisy was on a lot of drugs, including antipsychotics. She'd been transferred out to BC from Ontario. When she arrived at the care home in BC, she was very lucky to be at one her daughter had researched, which is an excellent care home that does a medication review as soon as their patient or their potential patient steps through the door. So the first picture on the left is, is Daisy before she was taken off a lot of the drugs she was on. And uh, the one on the right is Daisy afterwards. Um, again, just looking at the face of this person will tell you a lot. And this is uh, the most extreme uh, Photos I have of Frances. Uh, these were sent to me by her daughter, Christine, who gave me permission to use these photos um, and talk about her mom. Frances on the left there uh, is under the influence of heavy doses of antipsychotics. And she has something that is a drug reaction called tardive dyskinesia. And what that is, is um, uncontrollable movement of eyes, tongue, mouth, sometimes other limbs that the patient has no control over. And um, even after the antipsychotics are stopped, sometimes the tardive dyskinesia will not stop. So that is, is Francis on the left on a lot of antipsychotics. On the right is Francis after a medication review that uh, her daughter was able to arrange and um, a long taper off the antipsychotics. I think you can see that there's a great deal of difference in how Frances is enjoying her life. I think one of the things that Christine told me too was that, um, which was pretty heartbreaking, is that when Frances was making all those strange movements that sometimes the other residents would mock her, which really broke my heart to hear. So um, I'd like to thank you very much for attending today. This is a very, very important subject. Um, we need to be looking at this, I think, as a public health problem. We need to be looking very seriously about people being on an overload of medications. And what can we do about that? So thank you. And I hope you'll put any questions you have uh, in the question and answer box. And now I'm going to turn it over to Alan Castles, who actually, I must admit, got me into all this. Well, yeah, go ahead. Blame me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just wanted to, I see we've got a couple of questions already lined up. So I want to jump into those right away. But I just wanted to ask, I think, one or two questions to you, Johanna. I'm, just to let everyone know, I um, I heard this story almost ten years ago from uh, Joanna when I was asked by I was asked by Reader's Digest if I would write an article about the issue of over medication of seniors, and in the course of doing that research, you know, I found some astonishing things like the numbers of people, you know, over the age of seventy five who are given ten or twelve or fifteen medications. I mean, the, 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 the numbers are actually quite shocking, really, when you think that anything over about four or five medications should be sending off sort of alarm bells in terms of what interactions you could expect. So, I mean, this is a really important topic. And when you write a story for Reader's Digest, you need a, you need a character. You need someone to ground the story and the, someone that you can describe the data. But uh, so it was fervent story that, that I, I, uh, I wrote about. And, and if it wasn't for Johanna, I wouldn't have had that. But what struck me is um, one of the important elements, and, and Johanna wouldn't, uh, didn't mention this this morning, is that when you're challenging the medical system and you think that your, your elder, your parent or your grandmother is getting poor care or too many medications, 
it's really hard to actually say something and to sort of, you know, challenge the physicians and to do it in a way that doesn't make them put their back up. And analyzing Johanna's situation, I think that not only were they prepared, they did research, they, they went and looked at the, you know, available research around the potential side effects of these drugs, but also Johanna is very diplomatic and her husband uh, and her team together, I think, was able to approach the, the, uh, the, the care, um, the, uh, the physicians in the institution and say, look, we, we, we need this and, and do it in a way that didn't put their backs up. So I just, Joanna, I want to sort of congratulate you on doing that, even though you're possibly beating yourself up for not acting soon enough. But you can't, I can't overemphasize, I think, how important it is to you know, be armed with facts and a certain amount of determination like Joanna uh, and her family were, but also to have um, a, a sense of kind of diplomacy about the whole thing. Do you want to comment on that, Johanna? Yeah, I'm not diplomatic at all. <laughs> That's why I did the research, really got my knickers in a twist and got very angry and upset. But my husband has been trained in conflict resolution and actually teaches it. So I didn't say anything. I just sat there with the pile of research and my husband did all the talking. Right. <laughs> so so I, I guess the, the, the lesson there, be, be prepared, but also have your diplomat hat on if you can, right? Yeah. yeah. So an, another question, you, so you've mentioned the importance of a medication review and this is something that, that the doctors and the pharmacists are going to understand. What, what can someone typically expect out of a medication review and, uh, and, and how, do they, how do they get it? <laughs> well, you can expect everything from being told that everything's fine, you can leave now. Mm -hmm. um, these drugs are all needed to um, seeing somebody who has a lot of experience with elders and the side effects and interactions of drugs who will give you a very good uh, review and suggest to you what what drugs should be either stopped or reduced or safer ones added. It's hard to find those people. Yeah. Um, um, but, but I think what you mentioned, the importance of the family saying to the doctors, look, you know, our parent was not like this before she started on these drugs. So you have the, yes. the sort of before and after picture. And I think uh, certainly in my research, a lot of times, the physicians don't recognize the, uh, the um, uh, adverse effects of the drugs they're prescribing. So they don't know that, or they, they, they don't think, they don't put two and two together that the drug came and then the patient started getting right. dizzy and having hallucinations and delusions without saying, well, hang on a sec, what changed over the course of time that could have caused that? Uh, I think, any good physician who deals with the elderly is going to ask what drug changed because that's what changes rapidly and that and that's what can typically cause the problem and and that was actually what really spurred us on is because once we found out these new drugs had been given recently that she was not on before and then she had all these symptoms then we're wondering yeah. is it a drug so, and and, yeah. and so the, for the participants listening, if I could give any advice, it would be that you always suspect that any new drug, it might have some potential benefit, but we know it's going to have potential harm if it's being added on to a regime that already has five or six or eight or 10 drugs. We can expect uh, drug interactions and just the sheer overload of, of, of too much medication. So... Um, Jenny, do we, should we try to um, uh, deal with some of the questions that are coming through? Yeah, that would be a great idea. Yeah. So uh -huh. um, maybe, um, um, well, let me, should I just read the question and then we can sort of talk about it a little bit? That would be great. Yeah. So the first one from someone who uh, is SS says, would the drug interaction that Ferv had experienced not have been picked up by the pharmacy providing medications before the secondary drug interacting agent was dispensed. Uh, it's, it's a good chance that 
the, the most common thing in this kinds of situation is lack of communication. Whereas the pharmacist probably doesn't know uh, or not been told that, um, um, that the person's experienced a drug reaction. So, you know, when you say it would have been picked up, all the pharmacist is really getting is the drug order and yeah. possibly not even getting the reason why the person is given a second or third drug. So, um, you know, again, physicians and pharmacists not discussing things together can be very problematic. Yeah. What would you say, uh, Joanna? Yeah, I think, I think that's very true. And, um, I would love to see much more. I would like to see a, a pharmacist available for every yeah. physician that they can consult with, you know, around, uh, the drugs that they're giving. So yeah, yeah it's, it's, Extremely important. So, so SS goes on to say that would the why would the family have to request medication review and be declined? Um, it seems like a basic human rights. And and the person who's asking this is a is a is, is a pharmacist working in primary care in, in Ontario. You know, it's it's a good question. I think it's a basic human right to demand a medication review, as well as at the end of the day, it's the patient who puts the pill in their mouths. So yeah. they, I think, have the final say and saying no, uh, saying no full stop to any new drugs is definitely within your right. And I, and I think that a lot of times in situations where you're facing uh, health professionals, people are very reluctant to say no, even though they might say yes, they might get the prescription and never take it. I mean, people have ways of sort of <laughs> rebelling on their own. Well, I think one of the things to consider is that the beginning of this story was maybe 14, 15 years ago. Yeah. I don't think there was much as much awareness about the problems of over-medication then. Certainly when I started doing this work as a patient advocate, it's almost like people had never heard of it. That was yeah. 10 years ago. <clears throat> yeah, so, and, and, um, and, and, yeah, and I've seen changes as well here in BC. The, the provincial government just hired was it 50 or 60 more pharmacists to be part of these collaborative teams? Because essentially the, uh, you're going to get much better prescribing and much better medication reviews when you have the physicians and the pharmacists working together. And so, um, yeah, when, when it's problematic when people work in silos, right? If you've yeah. got in your situation, a geriatrician or geriatric psychiatrist is prescribing possibly an inappropriate antidepressant, uh, and then someone else adding tramadol onto that and the two not talking to each other. Yep. I think that was the main, the main issue. Yeah. Um, we're lucky here in British Columbia because we have Pharmanet and, um, and any drug that gets dispensed goes through this province wide computerized system. Uh, the problem of course, is that that system is used just mostly by pharmacists. Physicians often don't look at it and, Joanna and I have been talking about this for years, how, how can physicians be prescribing drugs without checking Pharmanet first to see what the patient's already on? But it happens all the time. And, and the problem with Pharmanet is it doesn't cover drugs that are dispensed in hospital. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. And that's where a lot of elders end up. One in nine people in the emergency room, according to a study I was just involved with, are presenting with a drug yeah. uh, problem, uh, not street drugs. Right. Just regular old drug, uh, adverse drug reaction. So, um, yeah. So we have another comment uh, from Lucy who said, uh, I'll just read this. Um, I have a sister with cerebral palsy that has been prescribed risperidone after a psychotic episode and takes two other meds she's been taking most of her life. It's made her very slow, zombie-like, but the neurologist recommended she be on the medication for at least six months before any other changes should be made. I am noticing a slight improvement now, four months after dosage change. So it can also take time before you physically see changes to medication dosage changes, which is true. Um, I typed all the symptoms I noticed after change and the neurologist did not make any changes in the first follow-up. Eventually he wants to remove the problematic drug altogether. In my work, I've seen dramatic changes in older adults when even two pills are dropped. Uh, good comments. I, I, I don't know. Um, you know, uh, the use of, of drugs like risperidone, which are antipsychotics, that, in my opinion, is probably one of the most controversial aspects of medication in the elderly today, is just the 
is the rampant use of drugs that are, are really designed to be used in people with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, but these drugs end up getting used in otherwise healthy uh, older people in care homes for a variety of complex reasons. But um, uh, those drugs prescribed to people uh, with dementia actually will increase risks of death. So, so um, you know, the, the world is now paying attention to antipsychotic prescribing, but um, uh, I think we still have a long ways to go. Some facilities here in British Columbia, maybe a third of the residents uh, in the facility are going to be on an antipsychotic. Do you have anything to add or say, Johanna? Uh, yeah, that's, well, it's very true. I've been uh, working with the BC Patient Safety and Quality Council on their, um, what they call the Call for Less Antipsychotics in Residential Care. Uh, that initiative started a few years ago, um, I think because of a very uh, bad case that came up in the media. And um, we have done some good work with care homes in BC to mm -hmm. get the use of antipsychotics reduced. Yeah. The problem is um, that those antipsychotics are sometimes given for what they call behaviors. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, the person might be calling out a lot. Help me, help me. I've had, I've heard that myself mm -hmm. in, in, in fervent care facility. And the nurses want them to stop. So sometimes a drug will be They'll phone the doctor, they'll say, you know, this is a big problem. Um, sometimes the person might be wandering the halls and they're afraid that person might either hurt themselves or go into someone, else, others, someone else's room and hurt them. And uh, they'll phone for an antipsychotic order uh, to stop them from doing that. The trouble is these antipsychotics aren't actually very good for those particular cases. Yeah. So one of the one of the things that's being looked at a lot is um, training in what they call the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. So they're trying to train people who work in residential care how to find out what is behind the behavior of this person because there's usually something mm -hmm. either they're in pain or they want to get out of a room they're in and can't. Um, there's all kinds of reasons that people might be making, making a fuss. Mm -hmm. um, and there's many, many ways of working with a person to either distract them or to help them or to, to give them to some degree what they, they need or want. Um, but part of that problem is that you have to have enough staff to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And as far as I've seen and heard, um, the care, there's not enough, you know. Yeah. You know, the, the, it's funny. We, we met with the um, seniors advocate in BC last week and asked her about this issue. And she said, you know, the staffing numbers, uh, everyone says that it's, it's low staffing numbers that cause facilities to overprescribe antipsychotics. And she said in their analysis, that, that isn't the case. It's that some facilities, they are just automatically using these drugs willy-nilly and others they're not probably, it, and, and, and they use them in, in facilities that have high staff ratios and some that have low staff ratios. So, um, so yeah, staffing I think certainly is an issue, but it's along, it comes along around really to the culture of the institution and usually one or two medical directors who are in charge who set the tone for the place. Yeah, that's true. So um, uh, we've got a few minutes left. We've got one more question on the board here. If anyone else has any other questions before we uh, leave, please um, please uh, send them in or, um, or you know, um, I, I can make my email address available uh, afterwards if you want to uh, send me a note personally or, or to Johanna. Um, the question here that, that's on the board right now is what's being done for ant opioid drugs that many older adults were prescribed way back when and new doctors are refusing to prescribe them. I mean, the, as you probably know, we're in, uh, in the midst here, certainly in British Columbia, of an opioid uh, overdose epidemic. And the College of Physicians and Surgeons, which monitor the prescribing of our doctors, has really sort of cracked down on um, 
the willy-nilly prescribing of opioids. And I think the, the, the side effects of this is that you do have people that have, are quite well controlled um, on opioids and it's not going to ruin their lives and, and a, a low level of opioid use is probably not going to be harmful. Um, but they're being punished by the college for uh, overprescribing. I know a personal doctor up in Salmon Arm who's facing this uh, situation. At the same time, um, I, what, what has uh, come out of this crisis is that doctors are starting to realize now a lot of pain can be very well controlled by much safer analgesics, you know, acetaminophen, uh, uh, a whole range of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that, that are used. And these drugs are often much safer and much less addictive. And so I think that the whole uh, thinking around how, how doctors should treat pain is improving. Though, you know, it's true, the opioid issue for older people is, is really, um, uh, it's a difficult situation. What would you say to that, Johanna? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm the public member on the Geriatrics and Palliative Care Committee at Doctors of BC, and um, there's been some some a lot of discussions amongst uh, the committee about this problem of uh, palliative care of doctors being really worried about cracking down so much on opioids to the point where they can't use them well with people who it does help. You know, that there's going to now be an opposite knee-jerk reaction. Oh, no, you can't use opioids at all. So there's some real concern um, around that from palliative care docs. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, as you mentioned, um, the doctor that you know, uh, he, you know, some, some people are using them wi wisely. There's been so much over-promotion of opioids by the company that makes them, who basically told all the doctors that they weren't addictive anyway, um, that we're now we're now reaping you know that whirlwind uh, of you know promotion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's we've got to reach some kind of balance. It's kind of mm -hmm. swing from one op opposite to another. Yeah. Um, just in the last few minutes, I think Jenny wants to mention a couple of um, really good materials that her group um, has been developing, and I just want to make a plug for <laughs> our group as well. So I work for the Therapeutics Initiative, and and we um, we create newsletters like this, uh, and this is on our website. Um, if you could just Google Therapeutics Initiative, you'd find these. Uh, we've published over or, or almost 120 letters on different topics. This one is on deprescribing proton pump inhibitors, and uh, this one is on antidepressant withdrawal symptoms. So the, just wanted to flag that the issue around um, deprescribing and trying to reduce the medication overload for physicians is very much on our radar. It's something that we, we were spending more and more time uh, researching and focusing on. And so it's great to be partners with the Caden people. Yeah, we're really, really excited to be partnering with the Therapeutics Initiative, too. So thanks so much, Alan. Um, and thank you, Joanna. Um, your presentation and discussion was really, um, you know, hard to hear. Uh, the story is, is hard to hear. And really, um, I think because we know how much it happens, and it's so important for us to hear it at the same time. So thank you. Um, so I... I've just launched a poll, and you're welcome to to help us. Let us know uh, how you liked the webinar, um, how we could improve. If you, uh, I didn't have a how you could how we can improve uh, section um, because we only have um, you know uh, A, B, C answer types. But if you'd like to send me a message afterwards, I'd really appreciate it. Um, so this is the Therapeutics the Initiative website that I've shared. Um, and I'll just show you Caden's website as well. Um, so we do have um, uh, resources for health providers as well as uh, the public. And if you go to the public tab under resources, I'll just show you, um, you scroll down, we have this brochure, um, which actually um, helps explain what happens in the body 
as we age. Um, so how it explains how medications are processed in the body and how we actually become more sensitive to the effects of medications and process medications differently because of what happens in the brain and liver and kidneys as we get older. So um, this can be a helpful tool for explaining why it might be important to get a medication review and really think carefully about the medications we're taking, um, especially as we get, get older. And um, I'd also like to show you an article that was written by Joanna Trimble, as well as Janet Curry. Um, and it is nine quick safety tips to manage your medications. And that's available on our articles page. And um, if you're looking for some concrete tips to help um, you or a family member manage your medications, then those, it's really uh, written really clearly and um, I think can be very helpful. So um, let's see, it's 2.01, we'll wrap up. Um, if you'd like um, Alan or Joanna's email if you'd like to contact them you can contact me and i will get you in touch with them so my email is info at deprescribingnetwork.ca or jenny.herbin at creugm.cusse.ca so that's how you can reach me and I can get you in touch with them um, our resources we make available for free for organizations across the country that advocate for and work with older adults. So if you'd like hard copy of, of any of our resources, you can contact me and I'll send them along. Um, thank you so much, Joanna and Alan again. Okay. It's really wonderful. So My thanks pleasure. everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.